is with some kind of deep personal story about how the game has affected me or some you know history I have with it, you know, something like that. But the weird truth is I don't have a really big personal connection to FF7. Never have, really. I uh at this point in history I wasn't exactly, you know, financially stable. Had a job, not a great one. And I didn't really have the availability to go out and buy a PlayStation 1. In fact, the first time I played FF7 was uh, playing it on the PC version. The terrible, terrible PC port that they came out with. Yeah. <clears throat> now, I knew all about FF7 before that time. As I said before, back in the day, I used to be a little bit of an FF fanatic. And I know you're all going to make fun. Oh, yeah, he used to be. No, seriously. <laughs> I mean, today I woke up, exercised, you know... Took the trash, or actually, I didn't take the trash. I forgot to take the trash out. Uh, did some research for an unrelated thing. Uh, started uploading the original lore run stuff. Started looking into a Raspberry Pi from later reason. All sorts of stuff that has nothing to do with Final Fantasy. Back when I was a little bit more of a Final Fantasy fanatic, I'd get up and look at Final Fantasy stuff. You know, a little bit of a difference. So, I was kind of following the information, for lack of a better term, of Final Fantasy VII as it was coming out. I knew more about this game than most people who were actually playing it knew because of how much research I'd done onto it. And the fact that I had been following it even in the Japanese release. So I knew quite a bit about the, the details of the story and the plot and the characters and the gameplay and all that fun stuff from the Japanese version specifically. This has actually given me a little bit of a unique perspective because obviously the English translation is, to be as blunt as possible, terrible. So, a lot of the stuff I'm going to tell you kind of comes from nuances that I learned the way I was first exposed to this game, which was listening to people who were fans who were translating the Japanese text and the Japanese dialogue bit by bit uh, from the original Japanese version. Ah, come on. There we go. Sorry. Uh, in addition to that, Really, Meadfist? Wow, that's that's funny. I'll talk about the translation issues in a second, because there are definitely things to talk about when it comes to the translation issues. But regardless of that, one other thing I want to mention is that... Uh, on the off chance that you've never played this game, you should probably stop watching this video right now. Yes, I am, I am with the Turks today. But, uh... I don't actually know what Takoda is saying, but I'm with it. Anyways, uh, so yeah, um, uh, lost my train of thought. <laughs> it's a little early. Right. So Eris dies in this game. Believe it or not, the first real factoid I learned about this game was the fact that Eris dies. It was all over the place. In Japan, this was before the game came out in the West. And people would not stop talking about the fact that a main character dies, and, and oh my god, Eris dies, and you know, everyone was talking about it. So it was pretty much the very first thing I learned about Final Fantasy VII. Seriously. So it's never really had that much impact on me. It's not like Tella, or Galoof, or Zack, for that matter. But for some reason I'm just like, oh, you know, every single time, it's like, oh my god... Eris dies, and whatever. <laughs> it's never really affected me as much. Which I find funny, because most people tend to treat that as, like, the, the really important main character death. Now, I'm not saying it was a bad move. Quite the contrary. It's actually done pretty well, all things considered. But, yeah. So, really quick here. I have a couple of notes, because it's early and I've had a hell of a morning. And, oh, by the way, Square Enix can go screw themselves. <laughs> But first thing I want to do here is I want to share with you guys something I actually completely forgot to do last night. The final counters for uh, for Crisis Core. So, uh, let's see. For the Heroes counter, we came in at 13 mention of the word Heroes, the concept of Heroes. I should have added Dreams as well. That would have probably doubled this, but we had 13 Heroes throw out uh, Crisis Core. Uh, and then what's funny is the next two are actually tied. We actually had 19 references to Loveless. Now, I was only counting, like, if he started speechifying about Loveless, I would only count that as one. 
he would have to then start talking and then speechify again to count as a second one. So 19 Loveless references and 19 references to honor. So there you go, definitive. Not counting optional stuff, which of course I didn't do. Uh, 19 Lovelaces and 19 honors throughout Crisis Core. We will of course be keeping track of the encounter counters throughout FF7, as per usual. Next thing I want to talk about is the weird situation with FF7. So obviously, for those of you not aware, FF7 was the first proper FF to come out in the, the PAL region. And uh, it was also the first game to be a smash success. Now, I want to point out, we've seen the sales figures. We know the reality of this. FF1, 2, and 3, a.k.a. FF1, 4, and 6, all sold very well in the States and arguably did better here in many ways than they were doing else, you know, in Japan, although that is debatable. However, there is no debating that FF7 did better outside of Japan. FF7 is the official moment at which Final Fantasy became more popular, popular outside of Japan than it was within. There's a bunch of reasons for that, which I want to discuss in brief as we go through here. Uh, but the first and most obvious reason, uh, or I'm sorry, the, the first thing and the most obvious thing I want to talk about is that this was up this was expected see there's a concept i call the star wars effect uh, and i talked about this when it came to ff1 star wars effect is when you look at something and it shouldn't succeed really when you really think about it when you really break it down it should not actually have succeeded let alone as well as it did just like star wars a new hope really should not have been the smash success it was and a lot of variables and a lot of luck just kind of lined up perfectly and you know as the saying goes the stars aligned and star wars was this huge smash success same thing with ff1 not true with ff7 ff7 has pretty much the exact opposite i'm a turk now jason bar I'm actually the leader of the Turks, I've been to tell you guys. So if anybody, uh, I'm, I'm going to be sending a bunch of Turks after Skronix's legal department tonight. And uh, you can use your imagination for what's going to happen to them. Anyways, so FF7 had all of the pieces in play for it to be a success. It could be argued that just about any major JRPG that came out at this point on this system would have exploded in popularity the same way that FF7 did. But FF7, that's not necessarily true, because FF7 had two things going for it that other RPGs wouldn't have. The name, Final Fantasy, which I remind you, was very popular in uh, in the States at the time. And there was a significant amount of demand in the PAL region for this at, at this point in history. So the first thing was the Final Fantasy name, and the second thing was the fact that the marketing department kind of ran with it as basically a next generation RPG. Marketing in general had a lot to do with the stateside success of FF7. From what I am told, uh, the European marketing department kind of failed on that one. <laughs> but uh, it, it, I don't know if you've ever seen the ads, you know, oh my god, you know, higher graphics, amazing stuff, next generation RPG. It's, it's not the, the old Final Fantasy, it's the new Final Fantasy, you know. And of course, Final Fantasy was a bit of a regular name here. Even people who are not fan of RPGs knew about Final Fantasy. Even people who are not fan of video games had probably at least heard of Final Fantasy because it had just be, it kind of been ingrained uh, into the, the, the public consciousness so far. And that is, of course, another point to be uh, reconciled or, or mentioned here. Like I said, FF7 had all the pieces in play. First, the name. Second, the marketing design. But third, this is when video gaming had started really actually becoming commonplace. Let me put this to you in a slightly different way. <laughs> yeah, no kidding, Chelsea Atera. I, uh, at the time, this is, by the way, this is actually the, spirit, the period in time in which I learned about the whole we missed out on FF2, FF3, and FF5 thing. So, really, Dark Ray? I mean, I guess that's something. Uh, I'm trying to think how to put this. Anybody out there know about Star Trek? I'm sure most of you do. If you ask most people what their favorite Star Trek show is, the, the statistically speaking, of all the people I have spoken to at conventions, amongst friends, and even on my own show, the answer has been Deep Space Nine. You know, it's one of the most common answers. But Deep Space Nine does not actually have the public consciousness level, the overall level of marketing saturation that another show does. 
the next generation. Just about everyone knew what the next generation was. Just about everyone knew about Picard, and just about everyone knew about Data. And when most people who are not Star Trek fans think about um, the Enterprise, they're picturing the Galaxy class, the Enterprise D. That's pretty much the situation we have here with FF7. But it's this is what was happening in gaming in general right now. Because gaming had been kind of on the upswing. Uh, in all honesty, one of the big games that had really pushed gaming to become, become more publicly acceptable was actually the game Doom, believe it or not. And I talked about that in my Doom Rumination, I think. Uh, if I didn't, I should have, because it is a very important thing in video gaming history. But remember, the NES was marketed as a kid's toy. And so we had years to get over that particular bias. In fact, to some extent, some of that video games are for kids bias still exists to this day. But back in the day, back in the 80s, that video games are for kid bias was all over the place. Even adults who played video games usually had to be quiet about it or risk ridicule. But that just kind of slowly ebbed away bit by bit as we got into the 90s and the SNES really started expanding its market and PC gaming started to become more accessible. And again, Doom, as I mentioned earlier, uh, became a thing. And there were other games too. But in my opinion, you know, as far as having an impact on public consciousness, Doom is the one that really pushed that forward. So by the time this game came out, we had a audience. Now, I am speaking mostly in terms of the states, by the way. I don't know how, how gaming was in other countries at this point in history. Uh, but here in the states, what about when, you know, when the PlayStation 1 came out, video gaming had become acceptable. It was okay. It was normal. And that's a really important thing because if you're a 20 or 30-something and you're thinking, man, I want to go buy a video game, there's going to be that little voice in the back of your head that's saying, well, I mean, maybe I don't want to walk in. And, oh, yeah, yeah, it's for my son, right? You know, that embarrassment factor or that uh, socially acceptable factor had been a barrier to video gaming really exploding back in the 80s and 90s. But in the late 90s, like I said, that, that had been fading away. So video gaming was, in general, in PC and in console, was just becoming way more widespread and way more saturated when it came to public consciousness. So, in general, more people were aware of video games, and thus, when more people are aware of the, of the concept of video games, more people then become aware of the specific genres of video games. How many of you remember the era when people actually thought the words video game meant, like, side-scrolling action and occasionally, like, top-down, you know, Pac-Man kind of thing? And that's what people just associated with video games, because the concept of other genres wasn't even something they considered. And I, of course, I, I remember that myself. I remember that particular era in gaming. Uh, in the late 80s, early 90s is the specific time I'm remembering. Uh, this was in California, for reference. Uh, so, uh, yeah, Southern California, to be more specific. Because South Southern and Northern California might as well be different states. But that's, that's another topic. Um, yeah, the arcade genre, basically. And, and again... A lot of this is due to a lot of the, the factors that were going on culturally and socially throughout these decades. Anyways, so now not only more people are aware of video games, they're more aware of the concept of an RPG and, you know, immersive character story thing, you know, oh, okay, I'm with that. So all of these factors help to contribute, uh, and there's actually more factors as well, uh, but all of these factors help to contribute to the fact that, at, you know, the next Final Fantasy game was going to be a lot more successful, pretty much no matter what. Then you add into that this was their first push onto effectively really pushing graphics. Uh, this is admittedly something that was great at the time, but in hindsight probably damaged video gaming as, as an industry more than was a good thing. Because if you remember, in the late 90s and for about the next decade, it was all about graphics! We have thankfully finally started getting out of the pit of graphics when it comes to video game uh, design and marketing. But this was the beginning. This game, Metal Gear Solid, uh, several people in chat have already mentioned it, but this game and Metal Gear Solid and several other games that were coming out of this period were really pushing the new hardware. The N64 was kind of on a downswing, and then we've got you know, the PlayStation and the Dreamcast, which were both pushing, like, graphics! 
and that led to the you know everything that happened after. I'm not going to go into it. you know Saturn came out, the PlayStation 2, the Xbox, all of this stuff was like graphics, and so there was this big focus on graphics for again the next decade. Oh, we're definitely out of it by now, Jongo. There's still some companies that focus on graphics, but at this point in time, it's no longer the overwhelming pile of whale blubber that it used to be. So. <laughs> FF7, or indeed any RPG that had the FF name that came out on a modern console with brand new graphics, FF7, was going to be perfectly poised to take advantage of all of these factors and be a smash success. And then you add on top of that the fact that this was also coming out in the PAL region. Now, again, you know, some uh, issues with the marketing as far as the PAL region goes, although that is third-hand material, uh, so I don't know about that personally, but... All of these factors mean that FF7 was finally what they wanted all the way back in FF4. You remember I talked about that? You remember how I talked about the, the closest thing to a definitive reason we have for why FF5 didn't come out outside of Japan was because FF4 just didn't sell well enough? Not that it didn't sell well, but it didn't sell well enough. Well, then this happened, and this sold well enough. Especially by the standards of the time. FF7 sold so stupidly well that it would have a major impact on the company for many years to come. Whether you consider this a good thing or a bad thing is going to depend on your opinion and your preference, but there is no denying the fact that FF7 completely altered and in many ways started the careers of quite a few people. Uh, let me just name one person right off the top of my head. Tetsuya Nomura. This is the first game he had any real impact on. He had worked on this game, on this series, since FF5. I've been pointing that out as we go. One second. I forgot to take my morning vitamin, sorry. Um, <laughs> uh, he had done work in FF5, he had done work in FF6, but Tetsuya Nomura was actually majorly involved with FF7. And uh, there are quite a few people uh, who are, at this point, veterans of the FF series and veterans of Square uh, and Square Enix, who pretty much started their careers you know, and really got going with this game. FF7 was also, uh, and I know I've talked about this before, but this is be the beginning of the baton toss. Yes, uh, Hironobu Sakaguchi was still involved in FF7, and would be involved in the series until FF9. But a lot of the old crew, a lot of the people who were involved with the FF series from going back to like FF4 or FF1, were starting to wind down and starting to hand more responsibility for the games over to other people. And, uh, <laughs> and I, I mean, again, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, I think this is the thing, kind of thing that should have happened. They should have done this kind of passing of the torch thing. Uh, hey, Tatal Lore. Oh, Emily! Hey, I recognize you. What's up? Welcome back. I haven't seen you in a billion years. Whoops. That was weird. Uh, but, hi. <laughs> uh, uh, so... Yeah, this was, uh, this was the passing of the torch. And if you pay attention, thematically speaking... Have a good day at work, Aethel. If you pay attention thematically speaking, and in terms of the presentation, in terms of the narrative flow, in terms of the character design, both in terms of the actual personalities and in the visual design, this really is when the series started shifting to its new look and style. And again, this is also when they were really starting to focus more on non-Japanese audiences. Uh, because of the whole popularity thing. Although, I'm, I'm saying that wrong, I'm sorry. After FF7, they would start focusing more on on uh, English audiences than on Japanese audiences, because it's sold so damned well out here. Uh, hang on. I actually made notes, guys. Uh, next thing I want to talk about before we get started. Ah, yes. So I talked about the passing of the torch. I talked about the success. Uh, two more things I want to talk about before we actually begin. I did start a little bit early. I, I wanted to get an early start. Uh... Uh, I was really, really pissed off about the Dissidia thing, and I wanted to brighten my mood. Uh, and I kind of want to get through as much of this game as possible today. I don't think it's possible to beat the whole game today, because there's just so much to talk about. I could beat this game in eight hours. In fact, I could probably beat this game in like six hours, especially with cheats on. But, yeah. Anywho. <clears throat> so, uh, let's talk about the translation. Now, did you know... This game almost was really well translated. In English, I mean. 
I don't know about in German or French or Italian or Russian or whatever else, but this game almost had a good English localization. I'm serious. What happened... <laughs> For reasons I don't know, and I'm just going to say that flat out, I don't know the reasoning behind this. But apparently, there was some dissatisfaction on Japanese Square Enix's side, and Sakaguchi himself spoke of this. Uh, Sakaguchi basically said no to any more uh, translations done by an external team, because apparently he felt that Ted Woolsey didn't do a good job. I'm not laying judgment. I mean, I've spoken well and ill of Ted Woolsey, so whatever. But as a result of that, they decided to just go ahead and do it entirely in-house. Which was a really, really bad idea. Basically, FF7 was translated into English by non-native English speakers. And it shows. It was actually a whole team of people who translated this. And while it's functional, it's also kind of crap, if I'm just being as blunt as possible. There, are, there is a huge amount of this game which is actually mistranslated. But then there's also the fact that uh, there's nuance and subtlety that should be in this game. That I know is in this game, because the original Japanese version, that is absent. Shrug. I find myself wondering, though. I have praised the FF9 localization, and I will do so until the end of time. FF9 was a brilliant piece of localization. And we know that there actually are uh, really... I'll point it out as we go through, Dakota. I, I will point out... Avalanche. <laughs> yeah, the... <laughs> uh, um... You should <laughs> Um, where was I going with this? Uh, keep distracting me, Takoida. Why do you do this to me? I praise FF9's localization. I want you to picture what it would be like if FF9's localization, and it's incredibly high quality, was in FF7. Just picture that for a minute. Really, really digest that idea. Anyways, I want to mention one other thing. I've said this before, and I said this again. Uh, <laughs> so because of the incredible popularity of this game, there is a ridiculous amount of behind-the-scenes material for this game. There is so much that I've decided not to cover it all. I was originally freaking out and having many panic attacks over the idea of having to keep pages and pages of notes in order to be able to keep track of all of the behind-the-scenes material for FF7. It is gargantuan, guys. Seriously. Someday I may do a full, in-depth, no-really playthrough of this game and really showcase all the behind-the-scenes material and really talk about all the makings of... But that is... That's beyond the purview of a lore run, and that's beyond the purview of me doing this right now as I go through the FF series in general. So... There are going to be a lot of things I'm just not going to be talking about or that I'm going to forget because there's so much there. It's, it's, it's right up there with Lord of the Rings. It's like, oh my god. Um, but I do want to talk about one thing in particular because this is when it becomes interesting to be someone like me. An analyzer or a ruminator or someone who sits down and tries to really pick apart uh, and deconstruct a, a work of fiction. Because you always have to keep in mind the out-of-character considerations, you know, uh, the times, the, the social considerations, things that were done for budgeting reasons or marketing reasons. And also you have to keep in mind... How do I put this? Original intent can affect a work. And we have to kind of divide a line between how much original intent does affect a work. Let me give you a direct example of this. Back in FF6, the original intent was that using magic makes you emotionally unstable. And there's shades of that throughout the, the, the finished product. And uh, shades of that as far as Celeste's character arc as well. But that was removed from the work. 
So I will mention it because it adds a little bit of insight into why scenes were done in a certain way, but whether or not that can be considered when analyzing or when speculating, that becomes a lot more gray. I bring this up with FF7 because I don't think there's ever been another FF which has had more changes in ideas behind the scenes than this game, at least as far as the FF series goes. I mean, this game was originally going to be a detective story. They were, they were thinking about doing a uh, an everyday thing uh, in modern-day New York. They were thinking about doing a thing having to do with terraforming. They were thinking about doing a thing where Sephiroth and Eris were brothers, and, or excuse me, brother and sister, and then they were going to do a thing where Sephiroth and Eris were actually lovers, and then they were going to do this whole thing where Cloud was actually, uh, the, the, you know, a, a secret agent, and just, I'm not, I'm not going to go through the whole list. There was so many ideas that they tossed out. And I don't just mean on the grand scale of things. Even a lot of the smaller ideas were like, originally it was going to be this, but then we went with this. Originally we were going to do this, but then we went in this direction, and so forth and so on. Um... And so, analyzing and speculating on FF7 is probably the hardest thing for me to do, because I basically have to just mentally ignore all of the original stuff they were intending, because there's just so much of it, and it's so varied. Uh, the only real benefit of the PS4 version, Veldrin, is the built-in cheats. The benefit of the Steam version is mods. There's your answer. So yes, this is actually something else. Actually, we brought this up yesterday, but it deserves to be repeated. Uh, the This game basically was being developed alongside several other games. Chrono Trigger, uh, Xenogears, and Parasite Eve were all being made alongside this game. In fact, the original version of FF7 actually had Final Fantasy Tactics uh, style of graphics, and that was the original engine they were going for. Apparently Steam also has built-in cheats. I'll have to take your word on that. They didn't when I played it. Um, but yeah, uh, so they were originally like doing this whole Final Fantasy Tactics style uh, isometric thing, which actually looks really awesome if I could be so bold. And then they were like, nah, hang on. And like a huge chunk of the development team basically said, we want to go work on Chrono Trigger. Chrono Trigger, as I've talked about before, is one of those truly lucky breaks where, again, where the stars just perfectly aligned and the dream teams of NX and Square got together and made one of the best games ever made, um, at least in my opinion. So, uh, yeah, the the two, uh, so a lot of those people specifically went over to Chrono Trigger, not because they were assigned there, but because they really wanted to do that. It was a project that a lot of people were were like signing up to be involved in. And there was some aggravation in the scene. They were like, no, we need to work on FF7. And they're like, nah, Chrono Trigger. <laughs> so, Chrono so FF7 actually got shelved for a while. And then they started cycling around other ideas. I mentioned the, the New York thing. Uh, that ended up being cycled over to Parasite Eve. A lot of the ideas from FF7, including the one-winged angel motif, actually originally uh, was uh, more of a thing over in Xenogears. A lot of so you're going to see a lot of shadings and on ideas and concepts that stretch across all of these games, not equally, but you can see how that ideas were being tossed around the office and then kind of ended up in bits and pieces throughout the course of all four games. Mm, excuse me. I think that's everything I wanted to talk about initially. Uh, so without further ado, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, real quick. Uh, Wait, what? Oh, thank you, Data Lore, in advance. Hey, Rai, Okami. Did you, oh, you, did you actually? Real quick. Fear. Also, uh, again, thank you, Emma Wayne, or Data Lore. I'm not sure which name you want me to use now. Um... What was I going to say? Ah, did you actually like it, Ryokami, as far as Chrono Trigger? So, uh, what was I doing? Right. Oh, that barely counts, Tecro. I mean, it does count, but that's not nearly as convenient as hitting a button on a controller and instantly having a cheat there. Anyways, uh, real quick. Obviously, Cloud is basically locked down now as far as naming. Uh, I haven't got any donations over the night, I don't think, but I'm going to just double check that really quick. Because I missed that one yesterday, and I felt really bad about it. Oh, also, I want to talk about Dirge of Cerberus. I just remembered that. 
God, I've got so much prep stuff to talk about, despite the fact that I have no, like, personal story for this game. Uh, so anyways, the cloud thing is being locked out. Oh my god, did I not update the second thing again, Anselmo? No, you're right here. Anselmo, $50, red 13. Let me update the second page. No, it's on both pages, Anselmo. Sorry, Anselmo, you are in fact wrong. I actually did update both. <laughs> uh, we're going to be cutting off the donation incentive for who we date uh, basically immediately because I need to follow a walkthrough pretty much from the beginning of the game to determine who we play as. Uh, did I seriously do that? FF7. Oh yeah, it's right there. There we go. Perfect. So I'm going to have to look up the exact mechanics of making sure we date Tifa. If you give me a moment. That's Barrett. That's Yuffie. Oh, it's not going to give me a guide? Crap. That means I'm going to have to pay attention. Damn it. Yes, Tifa has won. Someone donated. I actually don't remember who. Uh, but someone donated for us to date Tifa. And so we will be. I thought it was pretty funny, too. Hang on. Let's see if I can find a specific guide. I'd like to just know exactly what I need to do to date Tifa. I almost never get Tifa. I pretty much always get Eris. In fact, I'm pretty sure the last time I streamed this game, I got Eris. Oh my god. Comcast Business wants to steal more of my money. Uh, there's like a guide to dating Barrett and a guide to dating Yuffie, but not a guide to dating Tifa. What the hell? I don't know more cowbell. That's why I'm looking it up. Okay, here we go. I found like a really, really basic blunt thing here, so whatever. Uh... What was I going to say? Um, uh, let's talk about Dirge of Cerberus real quick. So I was willing to go ahead and just be like, fine, we'll do Dirge of Cerberus. I was not willing to dig out my PS2, hook up my PS2, dig out my copy of Dirge of Cerberus, hook that up, play that, all that. I wasn't willing to do any of that. What I was willing to do, I was willing to go ahead and find a video of like all of the footage, all, the, all of the significant footage from Dirge of Cerberus. Problem is it's about three and a half hours long. That's just raw footage. Three and a half hours plus discussion. I honestly don't think Dirge of Cerberus, to, to be as blunt as I possibly can, has enough meat in terms of lore to justify about four hours. So I'm not doing it. Moving on. <laughs> uh, hang on. Where's the infinite thing? I will say one thing about... Uh, actually, I do want to say a couple things about Dirge of Cerberus really quickly. First of all, uh, re-watching it, the game isn't actually as bad as I remember, although I remembered a few things that I really disliked about it. For those of you not aware, I actually played Dirge of Cerberus multiple times. So, yes, I've actually played Dirge of Cerberus more than I have played Crisis Core. Even still. But, uh, in addition to that, this is the important part... Uh, I wanted to talk about the things I don't like about Dirge of Cerberus and the things I do. And I just want to talk about that now really quick, just to get it out of the way. First and foremost, things I don't like. The gameplay. I found it immensely boring. Even when you turn the difficulty up, it's just shoot, shoot, swing, shoot, shoot, swing. It was really basic. Uh, and I found, I found myself so disinterested that I could barely tell you, you know, which bosses were difficult or anything because I was just kind of sleep moding my way through the whole game. Um, yeah, pretty much. Uh, next thing, real quick, uh, that I didn't like about it was it does a lot of things that didn't really feel necessary. Thanks, P. Watson. Like, the whole thing was Shelk. Okay, so she stunted emotionally because of experiments done on her. Okay, that makes sense. She's also stunted physically for not ha for having experiments done on her. Okay. 
Then they put her in, in the body of an 11-year-old girl and made her a romance interest. Not okay. Then, even if we ignore the gross factor, it's still kind of a... And yes, I would say FF13 is a net positive, although I would recommend cheating. Then we add into the fact she's actually 19 years old, for reference. But, I mean, Vincent is actually like 60-something, I think. Although he, of course, has the body of a 23-year-old, so, I mean, whatever. So in addition to those things, which are just... What? We then have one other aspect of it, which makes me kind of tilt my head. Because, and I hope I'm pronouncing this right this time, Lucrezia has a lot of additional characterization in, F in Dirge of Cerberus. I'll talk more about that when we get to the positive aspects of the game. Um, but one of the main reasons that Shelk, A, grows as a character, B, starts feeling emotions again, and C, becomes attached to Vincent, is because of the fact that she has been patterning Lucrezia's mental, basically her brain, her a, a backup of her mental uh, data map, whatever you want to call it. They actually have a term for it, I forget what it is, uh, onto herself. Which, if you think about it, means that a lot of Shelk's actual character is basically because of Lucrezia, or Lucrezia, or however the hell you're supposed to say her goddamn name. Which is just, in my opinion, honestly, more messed up than anything else, but we'll get to that in a second. Next point that I don't like, so I don't like the gameplay. I don't like that they did several things that were basically unnecessary, and I don't like the Shelk, basically Shelk in general, it should just be ejected, or at least completely redone. Um, I also didn't like how... I didn't like how I got a donation just now. What the hey? Hang on. A donation from Pokemibo. Uh, uh, well, uh, thank you. Um, thank you very much if you happen to be here right now, and if you're not, that's okay. Uh, I'm glad you liked the WoW lore run. For the record, I do plan to continue doing uh, the Legion lore run once Legion is concluded. I've been doing a huge amount of work to prep for the Legion lore run, uh, even to this day. I noticed you didn't actually put your donation towards anything. You just wanted to say thank you. So, thank you. I appreciate that. Uh, no, they did not Running With Grace. Uh, unless they, this is the PC version. See, there's actually only two English translations for FF7. Uh, the PC version, which is barely different, and the original English on the PS1, and that's it. I'm actually not sure which one this is. Uh, I suppose we'll find out as we go through. Uh, there'll, there'll be a couple of scenes with Sid later on that'll make it really obvious which version it is. Uh, what was I talking about? Um, right. Now, I know a lot of my viewers hate me for this, and I don't care, but... Uh, Dirge of Cerberus was too anime. <laughs> now, what I mean by that... Lord knows the Final Fantasy series has never really had problems, you know, going full tilt and you know, going over the top or whatever. But the thing is, and I've talked about this before when it comes to suspension of disbelief, it's the same thing about scale or tier. You know, it's like, here you have FF7. Now, for all that's in FF7, I still find FF7 to be relatively well-grounded, especially for a high fantasy piece. Um, I mean, you've got the giant weapons, and you've got, you know, the live stream and, you know, magic and all that, but relatively speaking, it's still fairly grounded, at least in my opinion. Dirge of Cerberus is completely ungrounded. There's actually a cutscene, which I kind of forgot about, uh, where... I agree with that, Jaywalk. There's a cutscene where Vincent, who is currently in chaos form, is walking up to Omega Vice, and the music that plays through it is awesome. Let me go ahead and give praise where praise is due. I really like the music of Dirge of Cerberus. In fact, I bought the soundtrack. But... Vice is there, and he's got, he's dual wield, actually in this particular scene, he's dual wielding just katanas. Earlier he had uh, revolver gunblade things. Anyways, so, he's got the two katanas, and then Vincent shoots at him, and then he, he slices away the, the, the bullets, and then he, he, he like impales Vincent, 
and then the camera kind of pans back, and Vincent's actually behind him, and then there's like this whole as it's literally all you see is the streaks of them uh, attacking each other, and I'm just looking at this like, really, guys? And then, of course, you get to the actual gameplay, which is and and that's kind of it. Uh, there are several scenes like that, which made just made me go, why? And that's especially important because there's... Now Now I'm going to finally start talking about positives of Dirt of Service because there's actually some really good scenes that I'd kind of forgotten. There's actually a really cool scene where... Uh, so Omega... the main. Oh yeah, by the way, the main plot is that the bad guys are trying to summon Omega weapon to kill all life in the universe. Uh, <laughs> that's a slight exaggeration. They're only trying to kill all life on the planet. Uh, oh yes, there's also the point where, where, Hoj, where Vice starts flicking things as projectiles with his finger and uh, Vincent starts doing the Matrix dodge to dodge them. Anyways. <clears throat> so the Omega weapon is, is sitting on Midgar, because of course it is, and is going to absorb all this stuff. And there's like a little cutscene where Vincent, uh, or excuse me, Vincent Cloud slices the, the tendril off. And then, you know, uh, Tifa beats the crap out of it. And Barrett, who has an awesome gun, it's a, it's a full barrel with three rotating barrels. And then probably my favorite pr particular part of this little medley of, of uh, cutscenes is Sid is standing there. And he's just lighting a smoke. And in the distance, there's this just muted explosion. And based on the size and scale, you can tell he's basically destroying, like, an, an entire reactor. And he's just like, yep. Which was pretty awesome. And there's some good cutscenes in that game. Most of the dialogue, mo most of everything to do with the WRO and Reeve was awesome. I liked Kate Sith's inclusion. And, of course, a lot of Vincent's characterization actually was developed in, uh, in Dirge of Cerberus. And a lot of his backstory... <laughs> and uh, and we learned a lot more about Grimoire. In fact, we learned about Grimoire for the first time. And we learned about uh, a little bit more about Hojo. Hojo's scenes were fantastic, by the way. I'm just going to say that as bluntly as I can. Paul Edding nailed Hojo. I wish I could do Hojo as well as Paul Edding did. And he was perfectly Hojo. That whole scene was just phenomenal. It's actually not Hojo. It is, in fact, effectively Hojo's clone which is mind-controlling Vice, but uh, it might as well be Hojo. And again, he does a phenomenal job with it. So there is, there are some really good character scenes. But then there's one thing that I like and hate at the same time, and this is the one I want to talk about most, because we won't really be talking about this as we go through Final Fantasy VII, uh, except to reference it, because it's only briefly touched on. I mentioned how Vincent has a lot more characterization over in uh, over in Dirge of Cerberus than he does here. It's because he kind of has no real characterization in FF7. Uh, I mean, he does have some good dialogue and some good scenes to him, and he looks cool, and I like him, but he was an optional character, and as such... Well, I'll, I'll talk more about that when we get to the game proper. All you need to know is that they talked more about his backstory, about his time with the Turks, about him falling in love with Luc Lucrezia. God, I don't freaking know. What's funny is I thought it was Lucrezia, and then I was like, no, no, they said Lucrezia, so I have to force myself now to say Lucrezia, even though that sounds even weirder. I'm going to say Lucrezia until someone corrects me on this. I've been trying, guys. Mako. Anyways, <laughs> this is what I love and hate. So we've got... Here's... here's I, I can't... I can't even properly explain to you how emotionally and mentally damaged L-Girl is. She has so many issues. Like, I, I, I'm going to try and summarize this, but this does not even get it across. Bobina. Yes, Bobina here. God. So, okay. She's working with Grimoire. He is Vincent's father. And she is falling for him. Ah, oh, romantic. Ooh. That's what I was saying, Lucretia. God. Freaking, really? Everyone just... I hate you all. Moving on. So, she was falling in love with Grimoire. And Grimoire, and Grimoire literally does this thing before their, you know, budding, you know, a flirtatiousness ever gets a chance to go anywhere. Grimoire literally shields her with his body and dies. So the first thing she gets is this horrific guilt complex. Of, and, and she starts idealizing the man that, you know, she uh, was flirting with who literally just died in order to save her. Then she meets Vincent, who looks astonishingly like him. A little bit 
crazily like him, actually. <laughs> Wait, that's it. We're going to start calling her Lucrezia Bob. <laughs> Who's with me? Lucrezia Blah. I'm going to call him Bunevesa Blah the whole way through FF13, just as a heads up. So she starts idealizing and, and going into Vincent, who, again, looks way too similar to Grimoire. It's actually kind of weird how much alike the two of them look. And uh, and so she uh, starts like, oh, ooh, ah, and they start getting really close. He starts liking her. Oh, Lubla. I like that. So he starts liking Lubla. No, that sounds too much like lube. <laughs> Never mind. No, no idea. She starts liking him. Budding relationship starts working there. And then she finds out, which is funny, that he is Grimoire's son. She freaks out. Immediately distances herself. Breaks up with him immediately. He's like, no, no, go away. And starts uh, instead completely focusing on Hojo. No explanation is ever given for her being with Hojo. Now, I want to stress this because this is actually a plot... I can't believe this is actually a plot point. Because Hojo and her did not artificially inseminate to create Sephiroth. That was the whole point of the experiment. The point of the experiment was to have a naturally born baby, you know, under all natural circumstances, unlike what was happening with Genesis or Angeal, or I guess I should say just Angeal. And then they had sex! Hojo and Lou Blah did it. Then Vincent found out about the experiments. Oh yeah, by the way, Vincent was a Turk. And one of the better Turks, actually, at the time. So, uh... <laughs> just... So then, in addition... So this is already just kind of messed up. Just even getting to this point in, in, is already messed up. Then Vincent finds out about this and confronts Hojo. Not about what happened with her, but specifically about the experiments. Hojo then shoots Vincent. What then happens is Hojo starts experimenting on Vincent. Uh, L Lady. Loco in la casa. Or not casa, that's the wrong word for that. What's that word for head? Uh, la cabana? No, that's also wrong. Yeah. Anyways, L Lady then decides to kind of shove this proto material into Vincent into a desperate last ditch effort. Cabeza, that is it. Cabeza, I was close. Uh, Loco in la cabeza. So, Loka and La Cabeza decides to shove this proto material into Vincent, which saves his life. But then, rather than doing anything at all that might have helped the situation, she goes into this whole, Oh, I have... I'm, I'm so guilty, and I've done so many things wrong, and I'm, I'm so helpless. There's just nothing I could do. It, she is basically everything that I didn't like about Cosmos over in Dissidia, except worse in every way. So, Loka and La Cabeza decides to just kind of start going with everything. For some reason. And for years, is totally cool with maintaining this whole thing with Vincent, and this thing with Sephiroth, and all that fun stuff. And then, she decides, well, I have Genova cells in me, which means I am now superhuman. So what's the best possible thing I could do? I'm going to go find this cave where we actually found the protomateria, which is also one of the first places where she considers to be emotionally significant place between her and Grimoire. I'm going to just kind of stay there and I'm just going to I'm just going to chill here for the next 40 or so years. Actually, that might be an exaggeration. It might have been like 20 years. Sorry, but it was a goddamn long time. And she just sits there in that cave. For the record, the way I used to say it was Lucrecia. That's how I've always said it in my head. I think I'm going to go with Loka and the Cabeza. I think that really does fit very well. So this woman, she's still crushing on Vincent, by the way. But only because she's actually crushing on Grimoire. Really, Dirge of Cerberus covers that. You ready for the real punchline? <laughs> She just couldn't do it, Enigma. Um, here's the punchline, guys. You remember how I've mentioned how if you sit back, 
and you really look at all of the compilation of FF7 works, you notice a pattern that they're building up to something. And it's very, very obvious that they were building up to another thing. Probably a game, maybe a movie, but something. And it was just abandoned. And we don't actually know the definitive reason why it was abandoned. But they were all... They're all... They were all building up to something. And there's several characters who are clearly established as will be back kind of characters. Genesis is a character who was clearly designed to be a, you know, I'll be back kind of a character. Cisne is an excellent example of a character who was, you know, will be back. And so is... Lou Cray Cray. Uh, reverse that, Jack. But yes, otherwise. I'm not actually kidding about this. Dirge of Cerberus kind of mentions this, but in the Ultimania and in interviews, the people make it clear, oh no, she's actually still alive and still active, even after everything else is. And she is the last bit of Genova in the world. After everything has passed, after Dirge of Cerberus has ended, and Advent Children, of course, is long gone, the last bit of Genova on the whole planet is her in her goddamn cave. And the way they talk about it is a very clear, this was intended to be a plot point kind of a way. Uh, Pokemibo, so we've got uh, renames. For characters, if you want to rename anyone from FF7 onwards. Uh, we've also got who we date in FF7, and we've got whether or not we do Tidus Fantasy 10. Those are our those are our donation incentives. Luke Cretton, I like it. So, anyways, that's Dirge of Cerberus in a nutshell. Honestly, I don't feel there's much else to talk about. I could talk about Deep Ground and how they're stupid. I could talk about how the main characters from Deep Ground are stupid. I could talk about how there's this really goddamn horrifying scene, which is actually very properly horrifying, where they put people in giant containers and then submerge them in Mako, which basically melts them alive. Mentally, in addition to physically. <laughs> but, whatever. Uh, personally, I think, uh, Vincent is, if we're counting Dirge of Cerberus as canon, which we have to, uh, yeah, no, Vincent is clearly and definitively the strongest individual of the main party of FF7. So, anyways, with all that done, it's time to finally play this damn game. What is it? 50, I've been talking for 52 minutes. That's my job, guys. I just sit here and talk. Uh, nope, don't want to do the update. <sighs> so, who's ready for some FF7? <laughs> this is probably my favorite version of the Prelude music. The only one I think that is better oh, than this. Welcome. Pay close attention. Hopefully, you'll learn something. The only one I personally think is better than this is the Dissidia one. Shiva? Okay. And thank you for the donation. Damn it. Uh, so Shiva. How's the audio volume? This is about as loud as the music's getting in the whole game, so this is a good time to see the audio volume. Thank you, Wilson. Oh yeah, I actually want to say one other thing. Uh, I do think FF7 is, in many ways, overrated. That does not mean I think it is a bad game. In fact, I love this game. But there is no denying that this game is a little bit overrated, mostly because some people think of this as, like, the perfect, nothing wrong with it whatsoever game. Which is a little ridiculous. <laughs> I love this game. In fact, it's among my favorite games of all time. But 
you know, I, I, I don't think it is a perfect game. Uh... God, guys, it's at negative 12 decibels. Is it really too loud? Um, right. So before we start, I actually want to mention a theory. Just I have to mention it now because I don't want to talk over it. I guess I could talk over it. Lord knows talking over it is one of the only ways I can defend myself against copyright garbage. So there is a theory, which I don't agree with, by the way, uh, that the, the entire game is a flash forward by Eris, or excuse me, Aerith, whatever, and that she is... Uh, a DB uh, and that the, that everything in the entire game is just a vision of all that is about to come to pass or that could come to pass or however you want to think of that uh, as she's staring into the Mako as she's reaching out to the live stream Loveless. Loveless counter. Don't worry, we're only going to hit it one more time in the whole game. <laughs> to my knowledge, no, Unselmo. Also, chills. I would say Zelda personally takes art. I had to think about that for a bit. Bad translation counter. I don't know, I've only got four digits on this. And all these people, oh, okay, now not all of them. Come on, newcomer. Also, why'd you ride on top of the train? That's so weird. A couple of config things here, real quick. So that, that. Pretty much tradition here for any FF. Quick, guys. Everyone, I want you to decide the color. Oh, actually, I know this is going to sound like a really stupid thing to comment on, but this is actually one of my favorite aspects of FF7. Seriously. The level of customization you have for the background is actually really awesome. Uh, my most common, I'll just go ahead and tell you right now, is basically... Oops, I did wrong. roughing it rather than doing the full thing. Usually I try to get it to the number, but this, this something like this is usually my my standard. You can also do a full rainbow. Uh, you can do you can do all sorts of stuff with this. It's it's really cool. I love how much you can do with this. Oh yeah, also one cool thing. Uh, hang on. Well, yeah, let's do it this way. Let's do it this way. You can also pretty much set up a streak like that if you want to. Anyways, we're gonna go with this. Screw you guys. You gotta get that potion!
Oh god, this is hard to control. Oh my gosh. Oh my god, that's hard to control. Okay, let's go. First encounter. Whoops, I actually didn't mean to hit that button. Because I'm evil next time. Meow. Meow. Wow, he used to be a soldier, huh? Not every day you find one like in a group like Avalanche. Soldier? Aren't they the enemy? What's he doing with us in Avalanche? He was in Soldier, Jesse. But he quit. He's with us now. Didn't catch your name. Well, my name is... Oh, my God. Thanks, Frieza. Another thing I love about this game, you have so many characters for renaming your characters. It used to bother the crap out of me that you could only do six characters in so many games. What's your name? Pineapple. Pineapple, huh? I'm... I don't care what your names are. But this job's over, I'm out of here. What the hell you doing? Well, I told you never to move in a group. Targets. That's why we're gonna move in a group pretty much from now on. Ex-soldier, huh? I don't trust you. Uh, what? It, it. Press the directional button in order to run. I can't tell if I have any of the cheats on. Like, is there an indicator? I can't even tell. I guess we'll find out. We're actually not going to be in super fast mode for most of this. It's your first time in a reactor? No. After all, I did work for Shinra, you know. Planet's full of Mako energy. People here use it every day. So the life blood of this planet, but Shinra keeps sucking the blood out with these weird machines. Yeah, I know, Darkrai. Actually, I suppose I could do something about that, but eh. Come on, boy. As an aside, I absolutely love this song. This is, I'd say, probably my third favorite song in FF7. And that's saying something, because I love a lot of this soundtrack. I could go get some items down there, but why would I get items? Yeah, I know, I can't tell if they're toggled starting off yet, because it's in the area that's blanked out right now. This is actually my second favorite you know, reactor-type song ever. Only beat out by Yasunori, or excuse me, um, Yoko Shimamura's uh, Super Mario RPG song, Factory. So another thing that I w I'm going to be kind of pointing out as we go through this is that this game is really silly. It's also really, really dark, but it's also really silly. And I feel like too many people forget that, and I feel like one of the main reasons people forget that is because of the compilation of Final Fantasy VII, as we've actually discussed before. You know, for example, the idea of Cloud being emo is actually incorrect, and anybody who's actually played FF7 can tell you that Cloud is not, in fact, emo. I am a little bit worried they'll remove the silliness from the remake. That is, in fact, probably my biggest worry about the remake. Because there, this is a very silly game, honestly, in many ways. And I do not in any way mean that as an insult. It is actually a great aspect of the game. We're not there yet. I'll, I'll be pointing out some silly things as we go through, but yeah. I'll, I will believe it when I see it, Nadette. Uh, no offense to them or anything, but yeah. Uh, so I think we have Ink Nun on. Gotta get some materia so we can get the, uh, the tutorial later. So, a couple things to talk about here. First of all, 
This is kind of a weird tidbit. Watch out! This isn't just a reactor. So, that is Sephiroth speaking through Genova Cloud to Fake Cloud. Now, the thing is, there was actually originally a cutscene here, which honestly I think should be, you know, it, I'm, I think it's a good thing that it was removed, where Sephiroth just kind of shows up, really, and starts explaining about Mako reactors and materia, and basically just starts tutorializing right here. For some reason, they left that one little tidbit of that scene in the game. I mean, that, 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 that line, this isn't just a reactor, is actually pretty much copy-paste from the original cutscene that was cut out. It literally senses fear! Sorry. Funny, Roximus, is every now and again it made me laugh really hard. The other 80% of it or so was the kind of thing that I don't find funny at all. You know what I mean? Yeah, alright. Hang on a second. Hang on, hang on. I need to know which cheats I have on. It's getting irritating. Where's 12? There we go. Hey, I can see the whole thing. Okay. Okay, so we've got that on. We've got that on. There, we have all three cheats on. So that's the speed cheat. Okay. Ignore this, ignore this. I thought one of these was a 99 cheat. Like, I thought this was just gonna make me wreck the house with everything. Say there's no 99 cheat? Oh my god. Alright, we'll have to use the other method of cheating. That's gonna s I mean, I guess it's refilling our health, so that's something. You're gonna see a lot of limit breaks, guys. I may have to play the Steam version so I can cheat properly. Oh yeah, I suppose I shouldn't attack while his tail's up. <laughs> I just realized his tail was up. I wasn't even paying attention. I thought I did too, which is why I'm really confused. Whatever. You're gonna be seeing a lot of limit breaks this playthrough, guys, because that's the cheat I have access to. That sucks. At least we'll have Ink done. And we can literally stun lock every boss in the game. Uh, no, Catabo. Oh, yeah, someone actually, uh,. Someone actually asked if I'll ever do the Baker's mod. I actually kind of would like to, but that's really a completely separate thing and not really the purview of a lore run. So. Come on. And yeah, for the, the, the mouths on the PC version are just terrible, and every time I see them, I'm just like, really? Not in the PS4 version, but there is one in the PC version because there's save editors to the PC version. All these enemies are getting in my way as I'm trying to get out of here. So yeah, uh, if you know what you're doing, you can get limit breaks really early on. I, I suppose we'll talk about that now. 
the method by which you get limit breaks involves killing and using. In other words, you get your next tier of limit breaks by a certain number of kills, and how many kills is required uh, varies from character to character. And you get your second uh, limit break of a tier by using the first limit break so many times. Uh, no, I would not, Tixer, but it's pretty cool. Yeah, I know, Darkrai. I'm actually really pissed off at myself right now, but I'm just trying to hide it. I really thought these were proper cheats, but they're not. These are ba barely cheats. In the three tiers of cheats, this is the barely level. But yeah, there's actually a specific spot in the... There's a dungeon uh, right after the Midgar Zalem situation where you can get tons and tons and tons of uh, kills very easily, even when you first get there. And I know several people, myself included, who usually stop there to grind for a bit, just, just to grind limit breaks specifically. I usually go to Tier 3 Cloud there because Meteor Rain... Oh, Loveless Counter. Uh, Meteor Rain is awesome. Yeah, pretty much max time. So, uh, yes, they just blew up one of the eight ra reactors powering the city. Oh, right, where's my guide? This is the worst guide ever, hang on. Eh, whoop, eh, whoop, didn't need to do that. I don't need to do that. Ah! Uh, you'd better get out of here. Hey, you know, what would be really good is if you had, like, a wagon to, to sell those flowers on. That'd be awesome. Yep, we're going to be mean to Eris the whole game. I'm staring at it max time, at least I think I am, and it's not that great. Like, what I need is just, like, this line do this, this line do this. I do not need three paragraphs explaining the specific reactions of the flower thing. Just tell me what to do, damn it. No reason to fight these guys, of course. A what, Magister? Stormwind? Zack somewhere is looking down from on high and just being like... <sighs> yeah, we'll talk about it. So I suppose I should talk about the reactor and the avalanche thing. So the plans for the destruction of the reactor... And this is funny because in hindsight, this actually makes perfect sense. Uh, were not invented by Barrett. I, I mean, I don't know... I, I know this is going to be a shock, guys, but Barrett is not actually smart enough to, to come up with plans for taking out a reactor. Instead, he actually got those from, I forget his name, from Before Crisis, one of the original members of the first Avalanche. And, uh... Yeah. Barret, yeah, Barret's not a planner. I'm not saying he's a bad guy. In fact, I actually like Barret quite a bit as a character. But, uh... Yeah. So he took those plans and went, went ahead with it. And it's really obvious, because the next thing he plans to do is... Let's just do it again, but over there! <laughs> Let's do it, yeah! What I find hilarious is, so, I had some people debate whether or not uh, Barrett and the, the second Avalanche qualify as terrorists or not. And I will admit that it is debatable. But I personally don't think they qualify as terrorists. They may take actions that are usually ascribed to terrorists, but their intentions and purposes is not terrorism. And they're really incompetent. Uh, these guys are amateurs. That's what I would qualify them as. And it shows in basically every way. In fact, there's a pretty good chance that if not for Cloud, who... We'll talk about him in a second. That first reactor would have probably gone really, really badly. I mean, I hope you guys were noticing how many things went wrong 
other than that that were not related to Cloud himself. But yeah. Yes, they do actually, Jack of all keyblades. It's called coal and oil. Seriously. Right, right, it's alright, let's go try to talk to. Yeah, there we go. Hey, Jesse. Bombs, monitors, you know, flashy stuff. Now, I'm gonna go ahead and admit something. Midgar just absolutely captured my attention and my imagination when I first learned about it. And I actually spent some time sitting down and trying to figure out how to make Midgar actually work. Um. I, I kind of decided that based on how it was presented in FF7, not in the Ancillary Works, that Midgar couldn't work. That it was just, you know, inf unfeasible. However, it's interesting to note that in future uh, works like Advent Children and uh, Crisis Core, and a little bit in Dirge of Cerberus, and if, uh, they, they present Midgar in a way that actually makes a lot more sense and could actually work. Just full of surprises. Because that frickin' pizza, the people underneath are suffering. The biggest problem was that if you do this on this, it doesn't work. Instead, they did something closer to this and this, which works a lot better. I don't feel like going into details, and I also don't remember all the details. Midgar at least makes a little bit of sense. The Golden Saucer doesn't make any goddamn sense. And I'll talk about that when we get there, of course. It's also probably worth noting that... Uh, Barrett at this point in history is... not a good guy. I think is probably the best way to put that. I mean, I have a hard time specifically calling Barrett evil, but he is not a good person at all. Especially at this point in time. In fact, actually one of my favorite scenes in this game involving Barrett uh, has Kate Sith, or rather Reeve, just straight call him out on it. Like, dude! Yes, he is basically in the same position Tella was at, Except Tella was angry at a person. Barrett's just kind of angry. I mean, yeah, a lot of that is directed specifically at Shinra, but that's a very broad thing. Also, Texas. There's Johnny. Very important character, Johnny. Most important character of the game. Real protagonist. Whoa, jeez. I'm blitzed. I just love them homemade cocktails, but they sure do creep up on you. This is Tifa. That is true, gentlemen. <sighs> Killing me, Frieza. Pineapple and pizza, OTP. Hey, Daddy, did you kill a lot of people today? 
Yep, I feel great! Honestly, I feel that Barrett at this point is completely emotionally disconnected, and I mean that sincerely. I don't think it even occurs to him how many people he just hurt, or killed, or damaged their livelihood, or anything like that. Beefaroni, I remember that. I'm going to talk more about Cloud and Tifa's connections to each other later. Now is not really a great time for that. Also, there's a bunch of things where Cloud is supposed to literally act wrong, where he kind of doesn't. Uh, at this point in time, it is relevant to know... Oh, I like that idea to go ahead. Hang on. Stop that. It is relevant to note that even at this point in time, Tifa's like... You're not actually acting like the Cloud I know. Are you okay? Was there anyone in Soldier fighting us today? Nope. Oh yeah, someone in chat pointed this out, but this is a relevant thing to mention. Soldier is pretty strong. Even a tier 3, uh, a class 3 soldier is pretty strong. Uh, if there had been class 3 soldiers there, they probably would have wrecked us. Uh, in lore as well as in gameplay. So... The fact that Cloud at this point is this relatively weak, even in lore, it kind of helps to emphasize that Barrett doesn't actually know the real strength of the enemy he's fighting or what soldier can actually pull across. Keeping in mind, there aren't really any first classes anymore. There's an asterisk next to that, which we'll talk about much later. Uh, so... One of the lore bits is that, of course, most of these people are, you know, leveling, but... The in-lore explanation for why these characters are uh, getting stronger is actually their, their excessive usage of material. And, uh, excuse me, materia, not material. Uh, not, not the character from Dissidia, completely different thing. And so the materia is the in-lore explanation for how we're managing to accomplish all the things that we are in-lore. Kind of like Magicite was back in 6, uh, the leveling concept in 2, the crystals in 3, the crystals in 5, etc. I mention this, though, because Cloud starts off not that much stronger than anyone else, and they should have really noticed that because he's much weaker than even a, a third-class soldier should be. He will eventually grow stronger, and that brings me to my next point. It has been implied, although to my knowledge uh, this is still in the realm of speculation, that one of the reasons that Cloud gets stronger over the course, uh, over the course of the game is that he is, shall we say, becoming more genova y that more and more of his Genova abilities are granting him more and more superhuman abilities. So by the end of the game, when Cloud has pretty much fully using the Genova power within him, he's actually really damn strong, even on an individual level, even in lore, but I digress. Yeah, exactly, Max Time. This just they just keep emphasizing this over and over and over how amateurish and ignorant this Avalanche group is. This is like this is like the, that college study group who wants to protest the use of nuclear power. And so they walk out, they send out flyers, oh, and they happen to bomb a nuclear reactor. And then they, 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 they give themselves high fives and congratulate themselves on a job well done. I mean, really. Oh, yeah, he's definitely stronger than most grunts. He does, he is still effectively a member of Soldier. He is still a Genova infused superhuman. Now, uh, someone asked, is there a limit on how much material you can use? Uh, there is a literal limit on how much material you can infuse into yourself at any given point in time, uh, in lore. But, um... <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, Sigma, that really made me laugh. Um, but to my knowledge, there is no going insane from excessive material use, However, there is going insane from too much Genova and from too much Mako, or rather, too much Lifestream. Uh, since Materia, Mako, and Lifestream, while they do function as an energy source, are effectively knowledge, basically just imagine having, you know, hundreds of years of knowledge just sort of dumped into your brain all of a sudden. That will affect you, and you that's why Mako poisoning exists. And is there a lore reason for us getting stronger in FF12? Uh, kind of, but not really. I'll talk about that when we get there. 
Wait, pineapple. Pizza, let him go. Looks like he still misses the Shinra. I don't care about neither Shinra nor Soldier. Yeah, I was gonna say, I think Kadaj is actually the person who uses the most materia in lore. And he does kind of suffer from it. Although he can get away with that because Sephiroth Remnant. I don't care about Avalanche, or the planet for that matter. I don't care about anything. Actually, yeah, Genevieve, that's a good way to put that. Oh yeah, so there's a plot point where originally there was supposed to be a suspicious person here who was actually a spy for Shinra, which is how they uh, uh, figured out where the headquarters was for the Avalanche group. Just wanted to point that out. It'll actually, it'll actually be referenced in the game later, but that is yet another example of cut content. There's so much. I'm not going to be able to mention it all. I'm just going to mention the ones I remember as we go through. Yes, Necro, that is absolutely true. Sorry, pizza. The planet is dying. Someone has to do something. So let Yoga Frog and his buddies do something about it. Got nothing to do with me. So you're really leaving. So then she pulls this. Now what's funny about this is she specifically says this not to try and convince him to stay. Although that might be a secondary concern. She says this to see how he reacts. Because real Cloud you know, the one who actually exists, actually did make this promise and have this whole discussion with Tifa. Uh, I guess ten years ago now? It's been a while. Can, can you do me a solid end code? No. But, so, she's doing this to see if Cloud knows things that Cloud, the real Cloud, should. Seven years ago, sorry. You have pretty eyes. <laughs> Sorry. What's interesting to me is it takes a moment for Cloud here to remember this. Because remember, Cloud's memory and personality are really jumbled at this point in time. There's a later line, much later, I think from Barrett. It's Barrett or Sid. I think it's Barrett, though, where he mentions uh, that Cloud just acted wrong like the whole game. Like, he'd say things that were just a little bit off or a little bit strange, and he'd know things he shouldn't know, and all sorts of things that were intended to be hints throughout the course of the game uh, that uh, that Cloud was, was wrong, that Cloud was actually incorrect, and the whole Genova thing. We don't really get that in, uh, in the English translation. We're just told it. Oh, right. Uh, I can answer that question directly, if you give me a moment. So I mentioned there's a lot of uh, information about this game. When I say there's a lot, I mean there's a ridiculous amount. Like, an absolutely insane amount of information. Give me just a second. So... What's the year? October 1st, year 2, was the Nibelheim incident, right? Yeah, we actually have a proper timeline, which in some cases goes down to the month, and in some cases goes all the way down to the day. Probably, Sigma. I really doubt I'll be able to beat the game today, especially with not real cheats! second. So much crap here between from before crisis. Oh, here we go, here we go. Okay. There it is. On October 5th uh, is when Zack died, okay? This game begins December 9th. So three months and four days is how long it's been from the end of Crisis Core to the attack on Reactor 5. There you go. It's my own fault. I wouldn't be upset if someone else made me do this, Pave Maniac. 
Or yeah, two months, sorry. Two months and four days. I can do math. I was doing October, November, December, which is stupid. So this scene is almost copy-paste, uh, word for word, what actually happened. He's gonna be like, Sephiroth! This is actually the first reference of Sephiroth in the game, by the way. Yeah, I imagine Cloud was just kind of... We do know that Tifa literally found Cloud just by the section, just gibbering madly. Just like all the other Black Cloak people. I've said it before and I've said it again. Cloud is the unluckiest lucky person I know. We know exactly what would have happened to Cloud if Tifa had not found him. Because we see what happens to all the other Black Cloak people. They're just gibbering, insane, barely capable of speaking, and they are sick. These guys are sick. Now, how long he was there, Jedi Mew? I don't actually know. But yeah, Cloud was just another black cloak until Tifa came along, which is really funny in its own right. Not a hero, and I'm not famous, so I can't keep our promise. But you got your childhood dream, didn't you? You joined Soldier. Uh, yeah. I mean, I've got the Soldier a uniform on. First class uniform, even. Honestly, I thought it was just bad writing. Wait. No, of course I didn't think that. Never mind. Give me my money! Where's my money? 1,500 gil, that's it? Jesus Christ. That kid stole more than this in the earlier thing. Uh, the money's for Marlene's schooling. 2,000 gil. Thanks, pineapple. Barrett's theme, which only plays like, what, three times in the whole game? This is gonna be kind of a trend in several FFs from this point on. Songs that only play like once or twice. Hey, Brigwin. Yes, I know how to do materia. Let me go ahead and just say that, of I, I've said this before, in fact I've said this over the past week as we've been playing through these. The Materia system is, by far, my favorite uh, alternate leveling system in the FF series. Oh hey, it's Johnny! Hey Johnny! I'm leaving, going far away. When I come back, I'll be a better man. This is goodbye! Hey, childhood friend, you better take care of pizza. He doesn't get hurt. Ah, I've got everyone to pick on. Yesterday everyone in town was peeking at the two of you from outside the bar. Pizza's childhood friend. That's a good one. By the way, I keep pointing out Johnny. He was actually supposed to be, originally, a more major character than he is. But they cut most of his relevance to the story. But for some reason they didn't cut him. So for some reason Johnny is just still in the game many times. Up until we get to uh, Junon, I want to say. And then he just kind of stops being in the game at that point. Uh, probably less so, Little Billy. Oh, excuse me, it's Costa del Sol. Thank you. I knew it was pretty far in. Right after Junon, of course. Thank you, Bregan. We here at the Turks uh, have a certain decorum. Yeah, I like that too, Cash. This ain't no private car. Split up! Oh, gosh, don't have all the luck. This scene doesn't make a huge amount of sense. You say something? I said, you say something? Mm, let me walk to this other guy way over here. 
Look at that, it got all empty all of a sudden. What's going on? It's because of guys like you. You've seen the news, right? Avalanche says there'll be more bombings. Only devoted employees like me would go to Migdra on a day like today. You work for Shinra? I won't give in to violence, and I'm not giving you my seat either! Tch, hell, you so calm, you're busting up my rhythm! So what's our next target? <laughs> Listen to Mr. Sears about his work. Alright. Jesse's probably on Tony, but there's a security point. We can't use our fake IDs anymore. I know, right, Jonatra? So, Shinra has a security ID system, which, it, it, when I first saw this, I was like, oh my god, that's really advanced. When I got older and actually thought about it, I was like, actually, this is really simple. Basically, you have a card. It's valid or it's invalid. And every now and again, you go across a sensor that triggers it as valid or invalid. That's pretty much it. It's a cool concept, though. But what I really want to talk about is how their usage of this card system is just another example of Shinra controlling everything. This will be a recurring theme, by the way. Shinra overreacts to everything. And they, they have this general policy of, if we are controlling it, we're controlling it absolutely. You don't move unless we want you to. You don't do this unless you want you to. You buy our products or we go to war with you. You know, it's it's a common thing throughout as, as their uh, general perspective. And it's intended to kind of help add to the, not just real life aspect of this, but this sort of dystopian tint towards areas controlled by Shinra, especially Midgar itself. Let's talk to this guy real quick. That, no, I meant to talk to, oh, whatever. I will stab you in the face, Jaywalk. So this is what happens when the train detects someone that doesn't have a correct ticket. So they actually have an automatic lockdown of the train cars. And the troops are actually like, Whoa, we got this. Now, what's funny about this there's actually two explanations about this situation. By the way, you can get a bunch of optional stuff here if you actually talk to them. There we go. There we go. Anyways, the first explanation is the obvious one. If you were paying attention, they flat out say, Yeah, no, we, uh... Hey, there's Johnny, by the way. Johnny! I'll talk to Johnny. Johnny's cool. Yeah, yeah. I'm gonna get robbed. I don't care. Talking to God, Johnny. There we go. Actually, I didn't know you could skip getting robbed there. Holy crap. Maximum security alert. Anyways, so part of the explanation is they moved the checkpoint. Barrett flat out says, we need to bail before we reach the checkpoint. But then, later on, Jesse says the whole reason that the checkpoint situation went bad is because I screwed up with the ID cards. There's probably an explanation for it there, and my personal headcanon is that the reason they moved the checkpoint was because they detected her ID cards. But I don't actually, as, as in the first time they went through. But I don't know, actually. It's only the beginning of the mission. And we're definitely not complete amateurs. Oh yeah, so this is one of the uh, the first leveling spots of FF7. If you go, I think, this way, uh, like six or so screens, it's quite a ways, you will find a security checkpoint, which has an infinite spawn of Shinra people who are pretty easy to fight. There's the actual security, security checkpoint. <laughs> That's true, they've got fake mustaches. Yeah, John, uh, sorry, I, sorry, I should actually explain who the hell Johnny is. In addition to being a character who was basically cut from the game, I suppose I should be looting since I'm not cheating properly. Nah. Uh, there is a group of friends who were 
friends with Tifa back in the day. We'll actually be seeing them in a much later cutscene. Uh, but Cloud wasn't actually one of those friends. He was never really friends with Tifa as a kid. So, Johnny was actually a childhood friend. Now, Johnny actually acts antagonistically towards Cloud several times, specifically because they're all, you know, like, oh, you're some childhood friend of Tifa's. No, you aren't. I was. I was actually the childhood friend. Who the hell are you? So, got a bit of a rivalry thing going on. It's also pretty likely, although not stated outright, that Johnny had a little bit of a romantic inclination. Whoops! Towards uh, Tifa. I can't imagine why. I don't know why anyone would be romantically interested in Tifa. Uh, no, that actually is where I want to go. This is probably a good time to mention that Tifa is actually my favorite character in this game. Legitimately. I used to have to defend myself on that. Thankfully, I don't have to do that anymore. But it's not just the fact that she's awesome and badass. She has probably, in my opinion, the best character arc throughout the course of the game. And uh, I, I would argue has the most character development outside of Cloud himself. Hey, Blue, uh, Blue Wolf. She's also... Uh, this is an interesting time to point this out. So Eris looks like she'd be the soft, demure one. She is not. Uh, Eris is very much a alpha male type, uh, sort of tomboyish character. Not really. Tomboyish is the wrong word, but she's definitely a take charge, no-nonsense person. Tifa, the incredibly badass monk, is actually the soft-spoken demure one who is far more emotional. Uh, the former Formosa. Uh, some people thought the only reason I liked Tifa was because she is physically attractive. Uh, no, guys, sorry. I don't like Scarlet. Although, actually, Scarlet isn't physically attractive, so that's a bad example, but whatever. Ooh, I like that. Defiant. That's a great word to describe Eris. What's funny is if you really sit back and look at it, Eris and Sephiroth have pretty much the complete yin-yang thing going on. I imagine that was part of the, their original character arc that was, of course, abandoned. Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm not into gyahaha. -ha. Cloud freak out. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. The first is that this is random memories that are sparking in his brain as, uh, as his mind is trying to piece itself back together, and Genova's getting in the way. Or, and I kind of like this a little bit better, uh, this is Genova deliberately allowing these memories to surface in an effort to piece together fake Cloud. Yeah, Tifa is in the running for one of the strongest monks in the series. Personally, I would put Sabin as the strongest monk in the series, but Tifa is very strong, even before the whole materia getting stronger in lore thing. In fact, in Advent Children, we get a pretty good shot of what an experienced Tifa can do with no materia. She actually holds her own against a Sephiroth remnant, at least until he stops playing around. And that may not sound like a big deal, but trust me, a Sephiroth remnant is stupidly powerful. Tifa cannot suplex a crane, train. However, she can uppercut a dolphin. I don't consider Yang a monk, but I've already talked about that. Yeah, Tifa is also pretty much the speedrunning champ if you're doing a no slots run. Because death blow. Actually, it was supposed to be Sephiroth. As for who's actually saying it, Jack of Elky Blades, I don't know. Ugh, I hate this. I'm just, I'm just gonna say it. How many, how many tries do you think it's gonna take me, guys? It's one. Three. 
There we go, fourth try. Jesus. There's like, there's nothing. There's no indicator. You just have to kind of guess. Even speedrunners hate that particular part because it's just like, uh, uh um, there. Do I have like mega materia? No. Do I have like mega anything? Like good equipment? Anything! Anything at all! God damn it. Yeah, nope, nope, wrong button. Hmm. I wonder. I'm sorry, give me just a second, guys. I just had a thought. I may be able to edit this save. It would take some time, but it might be worth it. Yeah, well, I'm an idiot, Joe's eyes. Hmm. Max skill, max GP, have all items, uh, have all materia mastered. Max love points for Tifa. Max level, max stats. Uh, actually, there is a thing to put Sephiroth in the party, but I'm not going to do that. Alright, screw it. Let's do it live, as they say. Sorry, Case No, but, I mean, it should be really obvious why I'm doing this. Yeah, no, John Otrino. See, the problem here is my power level isn't going to be going up unless I turn off Ink Nun. If I turn off Ink Nun, this is going to take several hours longer, which is unacceptable. So... Doing it. Uh, all I need to do is find a couple of things. Here, I'll chop off the local recording. So, for those of you watching on YouTube, farewell forever.